So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. One half hour before sunrise this Saturday, more than 500,000 hunters will be out, scattered across Wisconsin, and the opening of the deer gun season, and one of them will be Kevin Wallenfang, big game ecologist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Welcome back, man. Thank you. This is becoming as much of my annual deer hunting tradition as everything else. This is a... I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy it. But there have been a couple changes. Let me ask you about... Oh, there are always changes. Okay. We can no longer talk about deer tags. We now must talk about harvest authorizations. How politically PC is that? Or help me understand. Well, I'm not going into going politics. On. I understand. I, <laughs> I will tell you what has happened. Um, so you recall a year or so ago, the rules changed that a hunter no longer actually has to affix a tag to their carcass, the, the carcass of the animal yes. after they bag it. Um, so this was part of a, of a pretty large licensing rule package just to make the language consistent with what is actually happening in the field. So we don't tag, any, uh, tag deer anymore, mm -hmm. but we still provide them a harvest authorization. It's basically a coupon now. You have a, you, you get ho I however this, many coupons I this before online, you go hunting. Yep. Right? Yep. So uh, I have my license. I, I went to the website, tried to get ready for this. Right. It said, when you enter the woods, you must have your license and a hunter authorization. Right. The hunter, that is the, the old tag is now the hunter authorization. So it's basically a coupon that says I have the right based on what I purchased with my license to shoot a buck or an antlerless deer in this county on this land type, all those kind of things. So that's what I tell hunters is just treat it like it's a coupon. When you've shot your deer, you've used your coupon, you don't need that coupon anymore, but it still has that harvest authorization number on it. And that is the first thing that they will uh, give when they go to register that animal electronically. What so. are you hearing from hunters? Are they open to this? Is it gonna take a lot of more of people like you ex ex explaining it? Well, we do a lot of explaining uh, on the rules. And you know, every time there's rule changes like this, um, we use it as a, as a learning opportunity. Our, our law enforcement guys and gals out in the field are, are very education oriented on those, those first couple of years. So when there's blatant violations, yes, they, they do what they need to do. But um, we use it as an opportunity to inform hunters on the new rules um, and when they're out in the field. But what am I hearing from hunters? I think a lot of people are perfectly fine with it. Um, you know, a lot of folks did not like electronic registration when it started. Um, and there's two arguments to that whole thing. Now, from our perspective, we continue to measure compliance. A lot of folks uh, thought that you're not going to force people to go register their deer anymore. They're not going to do it. It's been such an ingrained culture, ingrained thing in our Wisconsin deer culture of you get a deer, you register it um, since the 1960s, that people are just used to doing that. So they're still doing it. We measure compliance. Last year during the gun deer season, uh, registration compliance was about 90%. 90%. And during the archery crossbow season, it was about 94%. Those are probably as high as they ever were, even with in-person registration. So if you're an honest guy and you've always registered your deer, you're going to continue to register your deer. And I have three ways to register it. I have online, I by the phone, or in person, correct? Correct. Any, am I missing anything? Nope, that's pretty much it. And I have how long after I take a deer to register it? You must register it by 5 p.m. the day after it is harvested. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I get a deer and I don't have an authorization, what 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 happens? I well, messed up, right? Well, you're going to need that number. So if you forgot it, whatever it may be, you, you can have it on your smartphone. Okay. Okay. That's, so that's important. So you just need that number when you go to register it. But if you are encountered by a warden in the field, there may be a little discussion there. They may use it as that that uh, educational opportunity that I was that I was talking about. Well, I got into immediately from we went from deer tags to harvest authorizations. I should have asked you overall health of the deer herd, number of deer this year, looking at uh, the season that opens Saturday. Well, 
we always kind of, we have two very different situations in Wisconsin. We have our farmland zone, which makes up about two thirds of Wisconsin. And there's basically unlimited antlerless harvest opportunities in our farmland zone. It's extremely productive country because of the crops, because of the habitat types. Um, all of those things add up to, we've always got a lot of deer uh, in the farmland zone. There's no real winter effects there. Mm -hmm. uh, compare that to northern Wisconsin, the northern third of the state, and then we have an area uh, in west central Wisconsin we refer to as the central far, uh, forest zone, okay. where productivity of the deer herd is lower. Uh, food abundance, habitat is different. Um, the agricultural component is not there and they tend to get hit harder by winter. So, um, you know, we always, I, I, I kind of like to refer, I don't really like to go to the, to the number. Okay, if I tell you there's a million deer in Wisconsin, you go, holy cow, that's a lot of deer. But another important number is between, you expect between 500,000 and 600,000 to be It'll be, be closer the, to 600,000. Over this season? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 600,000 so people were talking, will be out there. I understand you don't want to talk about the number of the deer herd because it's such a, it, it'd be a vague estimate. It really doesn't matter. Well, we have a pretty good estimate, but it, on a statewide basis, it doesn't matter. But it will influence your expectations of the season, and usually those expectations aren't going to be something that the numbers can live up to. If I tell you there's 2 million deer in the state, you're going to say, holy cow, and then if you go out and don't see one, you're going to say it's a, it's a conspiracy <laughs> yeah. kind of a thing. So that we, we deal with that kind of thing all the time. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, is that the deer population is in the high one plus million. Um, and like I said, we've got antlerless tags around the state. You'll recall back a few years ago, 2013, 14 winter was the worst winter that we've ever had since we started measuring it for winter severity and how it affects the deer population. Since that, in northern Wisconsin, the populations have bounced back. And um, I mean, that's where I hunt. And we were up there a couple of weeks ago doing quite a bit of hunting and seeing quite a few deer. And our, the public and these county deer advisory councils that we are, were created a few years ago, yep. they start the process of the quota setting and the deer population estimates and everything else. And they're recognizing there's more deer out there. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, the stars are aligning for a really good deer season here. Um, when you look at uh, the 17th is the earliest calendar date that our gun deer season can open. Uh, that's a good thing because earlier in November and going up to that period is the whitetail rut. So yep. the deer are active. Um, the closer you get to that, the more active activity you're likely to see. The kind of the tail end of that rut is, is still going on. So that's a good thing. We've got snow on the ground in a big part of the state. That's going to help hunters see each other, read deer sign, um, see deer in the woods that they might otherwise miss. I haven't seen any rain in the forecast. The really only downside here, I think, to the weekend is that we're going to have below average temperatures. It's going to be pretty chilly. I, the last I saw up at my own place was about 8 degrees on Saturday morning. And, you know, that will that can push people out that's of the up, woods. That's up north. But <laughs> most people go into the woods well prepared for that. They've had time to prepare for it. The other good thing that it can do, though, is that if they get cold, they start walking around and they push deer around. How did you, how did you do last season? I got a buck uh, in the first half an hour of opening morning. Okay. So okay. in Vilas County, way back on a swamp, it was a great hunt. So. <laughs> Look, that smile tells it all. Um, okay, I want to go back to the graphic talking about changes before we get to CWD. Archery and crossbow deer season have been extended in several deer management units, closing January 31. You want to talk about that a little bit? That has to do with those county deer advisory councils and high deer numbers that I was talking about. So we're trying to give them more tools um, to manage especially high deer numbers in their counties. And this was a new one last year, and there's, a, I think it's 12 counties um, that elected to go with this option to try to give people another opportunity to get out there and remove some deer. And then baiting and feeding regulations have changed in select counties. Now I know rather than try to talk about the specifics there, best thing to do is go to the DNR website, ba uh, baiting and feeding. Yes, um, we actually don't even uh, produce a paper map anymore of the counties that are in uh, where you can't bait and feed because they're changing. You recall that uh, rule that changed about a year ago where if CWD is not detected in a county yep. in a three-year period it falls out of that baiting and feeding ban. 
those can happen kind of at any time. So we don't print a map anymore because in a month it could be out of date. So we have it, it's basically a living document on the internet. But um, what, what's your estimate of the number of counties right now that have a baiting and feeding ban? Is I it most of them? It's, I believe it's 55 of Wisconsin's 72 counties. Okay, yes. and one other change, and we'll show the map of this, change deer season structure and management zones. Um, ex what's going on there? Every three years we have a deer management boundary review, um, and we included our, our county deer councils in that last year. That, that occurred last fall. Um, and as the rule process moves forward, all of those changes that came out of it, approved by the Natural Resources Board, now go into effect this fall. Um, but it was, they're mostly zone. So we have the forest and farmland zone that I talked about. We tweaked those a little bit in five counties. And then uh, we haven't really addressed our metropolitan deer management units in about 20 years. And we have a number of those around the state. Um, and so this was an opportunity to review those with urban expansion and things like that, um, where use of firearms and things have changed. It was an opportunity to review those boundaries and change them. Most of them got bigger. Um, we actually added uh, three brand new metro units around the state in uh, Eau Claire County, uh, Chippewa Falls area, and uh, Rock County, so around Janesville. So. And why are these changes important to the hunters in the field Saturday? Well, again, well, it's always important to know where you're hunting because when you register that deer, we need to know where you got it. That's how we manage deer. That's how we assess what's going on out there. A big part of it has to do with hunter harvest. So we need to know where they got that animal. Um, but the, the thing that those changes really do as far as the metro units go is it adds more opportunity. So the gun deer season uh, is uh, almost three weeks long in those instead of the nine day season. Um, archery season always goes through the end of January. So that's a new change for some counties, but that's been happening in these metro units for 20 years. Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned CWD, <laughs> obviously chronic wasting disease. When I go to your website, uh, am I reading it right? It is now recommended that every deer harvested be tested for CWD, Kevin? Well, it's not necessary for us to test every deer to measure what's going on out there. Okay. But is the advice for a hunter when she or he takes a deer to get it tested? If you are hunting in a unit where CWD is, uh, is prevalent. And how or, do I know? Or, uh, go to the map, okay. go, to, go to the website. And I, I think at, you know, by this time, most people know if there's CWD in their county, if it's been found before. Um, if it's in a baiting and feeding restriction, that's a good indication that it's probably, something's going on there, whether it's a game farm situation or whatever it may be. Um, but um, we recommend that if you're going to eat uh, your deer, which is the point of going hunting, uh, so we assume you're going to eat it, um, that uh, if you are in a CWD affected county, you get it tested. We are also expanding um, our testing area this year. So we're focusing, we, we focus uh, on regions around the state. And this year we're focusing um, a big chunk of that testing on the 19 units that, 19 counties that make up the west central region of Wisconsin. Um, there's also increased uh, opportunities up in the Lincoln Lang Glade, Oneida County area because a positive was found up there. Um, and we're trying to give hunters more opportunity than ever to make that easy for them to go and get it done. So the goal this year is to get 15,000 statewide. Um, it was something just shy of 10,000 last year. And um, <clears throat> some new ways that we're trying to get hunters out there to do it and participate in this. Um, we've got adopt uh, adopt a kiosk uh, right, so situation. This is out a new there. concept. Well, a kiosk we, just that we piloted it a few years ago, um, and I think there's over a hundred of them scattered around the state this year, and they're still focused in areas where we really want, you know, we really need to get those samples because of a detection already. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's like going to the night deposit box at the bank. You fill out the. But paperwork. I'm depositing the head of a deer. That's exactly right. So all and, the tools and, are there. Yeah, and, and to that deer, I've I've got to attach what. There's paperwork that you fill out that says who you are, where it was killed, all those kind of things. And you're, you're giving us the entire head because most people aren't capable or don't know how uh, to remove the lymph nodes and that kind of thing. So we take them back to a lab, they all get collected. Within about two weeks, you get the results. But back. it's a 20 point buck, I want it mounted on my wall. That, that there's work? other situations that you can do with that. So you can actually go, you can contact a DNR wildlife biologist who will meet you. Um, you can have the taxidermist 
skin that head out so you can get it mounted. They can remove the antlers and then provide the head back to you that you give to us. Well, so there's ways to do that. And then another big thing that's going on this year is the whole dumpster. We have an adopt a dumpster program this year. So this is a, a new effort to try to make sure that people aren't just taking their CWD affected deer carcasses, the bones and everything else, mm -hmm. and throwing them out on the landscape, which, which is a potential way to spread the disease. Right. So um, there's folks around the, the state that are paying out of their own pocket, sports clubs, individuals, things like that, that are paying to have a dumpster set in a, in a key location within their county. And if you get your deer, you process it at home, you find out where that dumpster is and you can take and de deposit yours there so that the, the carcass parts get uh, put into a landfill and properly disposed of, not just spread out on the land. Let me ask this broad question. Is CWD a bigger <clears throat> concern than one year ago when we had this show? I would say it is. And the reason is because there's more and more research coming out that's telling us more and more about the disease. Um, here in Wisconsin, we have a big research, pro research bleh, project down in southwest Wisconsin. And... Um, they're finding some very interesting things out there. They, you know, we've, um, they're radio collaring hundreds of deer um, and they are doing, um, it, they're doing a rectal biopsy, a tissue sample from that animal. Now that's not a hundred percent indicator if an animal has CWD, mm -hmm. but it's, it's fairly high and it's, it's uh, sufficient enough to do this research that they know animals that are out there with CWD. And we can compare how an animal that has CWD versus an animal that doesn't have CWD, what's their chance of making it through the year? And the very preliminary uh, findings, and I shouldn't call them findings because this is, it, it's one year of research, so that doesn't tell you a lot. It's a five-year project. Um, but what we're already seeing uh, in that first year was that if you were a deer that did not have CWD, mm -hmm. you had something like a 75 or 80% chance that you were gonna be alive at the end of the year. If you were a deer with CWD, you had about a 25% chance that you were gonna be alive at the end of the year. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the, die, that the deer would die from CWD. These are new numbers. You and I haven't talked about no, these No, we've never talked about I'm these. I'm sorry, excuse yeah. me, go ahead. Um, if, um, as I was saying, that, that animal with CWD has a much higher likelihood of being dead. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it died of CWD, but it, it may mean it's more susceptible to being shot by a hunter. It may be more susceptible to being hit by a car or caught by a predator or something like that. So it's like a lot of diseases, um, you know, say cancer, you may die of pneumonia, but pneumonia was, call it a side effect or whatever yeah. of the bigger a picture. Secondary cause. And that seems to be exactly what's happening. But like I said, it's it's not official. There's, there's several years to go in this research before we really know what's going on out there. Well, that's really interesting. But um, so... The prudent recommendations of you and DNR is this. If you're in a zone with uh, CWD, mm -hmm. have your deer tested mm -hmm. and wait for the results. If it comes back positive, do not eat that deer, correct? It is recommended by the health organizations that a deer with CWD not be eaten. Yes. And why? <clears throat> why? Well, I, the feeling is that the risk, um, you know, there are similar diseases to CWD. And I, I'm not, I don't want to turn this into a scare thing no. here, okay? But Both of us do facts, not want to turn it into a scare. The facts of it here are that there are similar diseases that have jumped the species barrier. Okay. There's research out there that they feel is strong enough to indicate that there's a possibility that, there, that uh, the disease could jump the species barrier in this case. Um, so mad cow disease was one that jumped the species barrier. Scrapies is one similar disease that has not jumped at least the human species barrier, okay? So they're, all of these, uh, these type of diseases are not the same, but they're all in the same family. Um, and they just feel that there is enough evidence out there that the risk is not zero that you a person could get it. You talk to a lot of hunters. Do most of them not eat or feed to their families a, a positive? Um, most people either, if it's positive, they won't eat it or they don't get it tested at all and okay. they feed it to everybody. Okay. Now, let's talk about another change. I think it was just kicked in last year. It removed the age limit, correct? 
Correct. Um, how did that go? And do you see more and more young people? Uh, well, uh, when you take away the age limit, children as young as, is there any minimum? There were newborn babies who had a deer license, but that was a novelty thing that dad or grandpa or grandma, somebody said, I'm gonna, you're gonna have a deer hunting license every year of your life. So there weren't one-year-old toddlers out there with guns. With, uh, okay. No, the, I believe the youngest age that I heard was six of a deer that was actually registered. Okay, but let's talk about that. Okay. So when, when you remove the age limit, mm -hmm. they added the caveat that you must be with what? A relative, an experienced hunter? Well, what? that actually wasn't added. I mean, that, those rules were in place before that if a, if a child was between the ages of 10 and 12, mm -hmm. or even an adult that has never taken a hunter safety program, they could go out under the hunter, the mentored hunting opportunities. Okay. And that meant that at all times, Somebody had to be, an experienced hunter had to be within arm's length of that child. Okay. Um, so those rules were already in place. So they lifted the 10 year uh, minimum age. Minimum age. It still means that kid has to be within arm's length of somebody. Um, and you know, the really good news of any of this, there are kids out there doing it and their, their moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas and whoever are proud as can be of them. We've seen plenty of pictures of seven and eight and nine year old kids holding nice bucks and holding their does and things like that. And, you know, there's some, I, I've seen this a lot of times with my own kids or friends, children. Some kids just have it. They have that instinct mm -hmm. and they, you know, they've been around firearms their whole lives. They've seen the adults with them. They, their mom or dad or whoever has taken them out hunting with them. And some of them just have that instinct and other kids are just not cut out for it. And right. I think that kind of, that comes out, you know, as they go. Um, but we've never had an accident with one of those very young kids. Um, in fact, Wisconsin deer hunting continues to be one of the safest outdoor recreational sports in our state. Um, last year and 2016, we did not have a fatality in the state, uh, at least not a, a gunshot. Now right. people do fall out of tree stands and you know have a heart attack dragging their deer out and things like that, right. unfortunately. Um, but uh, we've had uh, only five or six shootings each of the last two years, uh, hunting accidents. Yes. Um, oftentimes those are in the same group or self-inflicted. So that it is probably a little bit more of a concern this year, um, just going into it, and I'm speculating here, of course, but it's gonna be colder out. People are gonna have more clothes on, they're gonna have heavier gloves on. All those kind of things should make people just slow down, take your time, think about what you're doing. You know, Those kind of things can cause a person to have an accident. So we're gonna have cold weather and people need to take it easy. Even getting up into their tree stands, more clothes on, more bulk, makes it harder to grab onto the rungs, all those kind of things. Well, so. you, you've got, the DNR has a three-point <clears throat> rule. In other words, when you climb into the deer stand, always have three points. Right, of, yeah. right. Okay. And, and there are so many good devices out there now. I mean, once you get up there, you tie yourself in, but there's devices now that you can actually tie yourself in while you're on the ground, and it, and it goes with you as you go up into the stand. Okay. Great, great device. Let's talk about the overall popularity of deer hunting because the Wisconsin Policy Forum just today came out with a report. They looked at the number of licenses over a 18 year window, and that's important, 1999 to 2017, reporting a drop of 5.8%. Um, is gun deer hunting less popular across Wisconsin? If so, why, Kevin? Well, the numbers are, our numbers of hunters are down. Um, and that is a national trend. So this isn't just a Wisconsin thing. I think you're seeing that in every single state. A big portion of what is happening here is that you have that baby boomer generation after the 1940s, everybody hunted. Be careful, you you're, on a farm. Be careful you're talking to one. Go ahead. I know that. I understand. I know. Okay. I'm, it's not an insult. And we do boomers. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I know. Um, so many more people hunted back then. They grew yeah. up on farms, they grew up in more rural communities. The, our cities were not as large. They had opportunity. I know people that used to deer hunt right out where West Town Mall currently sits. Okay, so as those things, as those opportunities go away, but as those folks get older, they're dropping out of hunting. My dad is one of them, he's 86 years old. He can't go hunting this year, his health won't allow him to. Um, so when you take that biggest segment of your hunters and they start to fade out, certainly your numbers are going to drop and that's happening in every state. Okay. The good thing about Wisconsin is that we still have, uh, I believe we have like 895,000 
hunters in Wisconsin. Yes. About 88% of those deer hunt. Um, and our net, our trends are not dropping to the same rate as they are in other states. Ours are dropping less. Are you finding that millennials are less interested in gun deer hunting? You'd be surprised at how many of those are getting very interested in it. And a lot of them, so we've got programs in the department, mentored hunts and things like that, um, that are helping those 20 something and 30 something year olds that have never hunted before get into it. And a big part of it for them is this whole idea of grow your own food, acquire your own food, um, don't eat, you know, whatever, wherever it was raised in a pen, mm -hmm. go out and get your own food. You know, some of that started, uh, was it the guy that created Facebook? You know, he says, I won't eat a chicken unless I kill it myself. That influences that gener generation of people, and there are more of them into that. There are more people, I mean, there are restaurants around the country starting up that people are looking for these new adventures in cuisine, yeah. and wild game is one of those. So um, the numbers might be down a little bit in Wisconsin, but this is a huge part of our tradition, and deer hunting is alive and well in our state. Where does Wisconsin rank in terms of gun deer hunts nationally? Are, are we one of the top states? We are, I think we're like the number two state number in the two. country as Who's far first? as license sales go. Who's first? I don't know that, but I believe, I saw that we're number two, but I am guessing it's either Texas, Pennsylvania, or Michigan. Okay. Um, we are always in the top five in the total number of deer We're harvested. number two. We're number two. Hey, we'll take number two. You know, and a big part of what's going on <clears throat> that I think a lot of people don't realize is that all of our conservation efforts, our fish and game, our public lands, so much of that is funded by the hunting dollar. Yep. And it's not only license sales and the gas and the food and everything that people spend when they do it, but Wisconsin also gets quite a bit of federal money because hunting is such a big thing here. The Pittman-Robertson Act, uh, that is an excise tax on hunting and fishing gear, hunting gear, that kind of thing. We get a lot of that money back here in Wisconsin, and that benefits endangered resources. Uh, you like to go pick mushrooms on public lands. That public land is was purchased you know, and is maintained with some of that money. So it benefits everybody, uh, whether you're for deer hunting or opposed to deer hunting or just like deer hunting so that one doesn't jump in front of your car, whatever it may be, this benefits you in some way. And it's what makes Wisconsin great. We have great natural resources in Wisconsin, great public land base, clean lakes, clean air. This helps. Okay, but I have a real minor question. <clears throat> this law that allowed pink outfits pink camouflage <laughs> go there. Have, have have you seen anybody in pink i have not seen a hunter in pink myself um and i am very glad to say that as far as i am aware of we have never had a hunting accident that included somebody with pink and that was a concern from the start so most people are still wearing blaze orange you know you spend a lot of money on blaze orange clothing three four years ago mm -hmm. and when a rule changes i don't think most people are going to throw all that several hundred dollars worth of clothes in the garbage to go out and buy a new color. So we're poised for a <clears throat> great hunt? I think things Beginning are Saturday very before good. sun up. You bet. Okay. And you're gonna be in Vilas County? I sure will. And you never tell us where, do you? Nope. <laughs> Kevin Wollenfang, big game ecologist with the with the with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Thank you. You are welcome. Thanks.